Well, as I said, we're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 30 tonight, but we're going to be starting off in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But what Moses is doing back in Numbers is giving final instruction in, in how a society that is of God is to operate. Now, we know biblically as well as observationally that God is a God of order. We see that in creation. We see it in the Scriptures. We should see it in our daily lives. The Holy Spirit, we even see it in the Godhead, as the Holy Spirit leads men to the Son, the Son leads mankind to the Father. And so God does things in a very orderly way. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So peace, peace is what comes as we follow God's order. Now a lot of times we'll look at God's order and we'll think that we've got a better idea. Or we'll think, well, that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But the order and the commands and the desires of the Lord that he lays out for us, in essence, is what he's saying. When you do this, when you fit in the confines of this or follow the parameters of what I have laid here, this is what I am going to bless. If you don't follow the ways that I have set before you, the orders that I have set in stone, then I'm not going to bless that. You may have a better idea, but it's not a better idea. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let all things be done in decently and in order. And really, both the context of those scriptures are in the operation of spiritual giftings. So how much more so in the daily, well, just the daily issues of our lives, the daily relationships of our lives. And so again, Israel is getting ready to enter in to the promised land, and God is laying these things before them so that they're would not be confusion, so that society would operate as God desires that it would operate. Now in the next book, after Numbers, is Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, even the word says, the second giving of the law. The first giving was right out of Egypt in Exodus, and then there was that period of of, uh, really, really of 38 years. And then now the in Deuteronomy, just before they enter in is the giving of the law. But I would imagine why these issues are being addressed in the last couple of chapters of the book of Numbers is because they were issues of the day. Well, these are definitely issues of our day as well. So what we're going to look at in God is God's means of order when it comes to the relationships of men and women, something that humanity has been struggling with throughout the ages, And I say that literally because right off the bat, there was going to be issues. As soon as sin entered in, God said in Genesis 3, uh, excuse me, Genesis 3, verse 16, speaking to Eve, your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And really what that means is your desire is to to, to, to rule over your husband but it's God's desire that the husband would rule over her. Now, not rule over her in a cruel way, in a domineering way, but that he would be the spiritual leader. But in our society, we've gotten away from that. Matter of fact, if I was speaking to a secular crowd here today, the majority of them probably would have gotten up and walked out. And matter of fact, we don't like to be told that other people are going to be ruling over us. We don't like to be told that we need to submit. Uh, I've heard every argument in the book on why a husband should not love his wife as Christ loved the church, because she, and then they'll give you the list, or why a woman ought not to submit to her husband because he, and then she will give the list. But again, the simple fact of the matter is, that's what God blesses when we are obedient to God's means of order that he has spelled out for us. But today, in our society, what we've seen is the damage that happens when we veer from that order. We see how the family unit has basically been destroyed from what it used to be and how families are not what they used to be. We see as the mother's influence is not predominantly in the house anymore because society has restructured so many things. We see the family's not what it used to be. Two ways that God's order and husbands' and wives' roles have become defiled are really by two extremes, at least in the examples. The first is what was considered to be male chauvinism, which is man's way of lording over a woman who has been placed in the vulnerable position of submitting to his leadership. 
in order to prevent this and to protect the woman, God had commanded men in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 25, to love your wives as Christ loved the church. And so God has commanded the man to be the spiritual leader. In order for him to be the spiritual leader, and you've read the chapter, the woman has been commanded to submit to him and respecting him unconditionally. In order to protect the woman in her vulnerability, he has told him, your means and your methods of leadership, well, the example that is set is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you're making these decisions, as you're directing the family and directing your wife, you need to do so in a self-sacrificial way. And so what that tells me is, if she's not submitted to you, men, you've got a greater opportunity to be sacrificial, to love sacrificially. Because sacrificial love demands that person who does not deserving of it. Christ came and he died on the cross for the church. He died, well, he died for all of mankind when all of mankind should have been condemned. So instead of abusing authority, a man is to submit to God's authority by being Christ-like. But when a male chauvinistic attitude enters into that, when a domineering person takes up those reins and uses it to abuse somebody, then he does damage to God's order. Now, in response to the chauvinistic male came the attack from the other perspective, feminism. Kind of a reaction to the overreaction of the chauvinism. A woman's way of exalting their roles apart from God that, again, has caused damage in society and the family unit. In Malachi chapter 2, verse 15, it says... But did he not make them, speaking of husband and wife, one? Having a remnant of the Spirit, and the idea is he just didn't do it halfway. He did it through the total power of the Holy Spirit. He says, and why one? Why did he make them one? Because he wants godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. So as a woman is fulfilling the role of a woman, and as the man is fulfilling the role of a man, and as they are doing it under biblical principles or biblical order, then we see the family unit, and then as the family unit is all that it can be, then we see society being all that God would desire for it to be. So either male or female, it's our propensity to point out our self-importance or to exalt our importance, and that has done great damage within our society. We so need the, well, we so need, feel that we need to defend our point of view, our feelings, or our positions in, in so many different areas. We've kind of dug into opposing sides, and no man's land is in the middle. And again, we've got marriages, not all that they can be. Relationships that aren't fulfilling what God desired for them to be fulfilled, or for them to fulfill. And again, the effect has been upon society. Well, the Apostle Paul, that's the basis of what he's pointing out here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn or shaved. But if, if it is shameful for a woman to be shaved or shorn or shaved, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. So, because Paul used the example here of the relationship between Father and Messiah, I need to see the reality of it when it comes to man and woman. Again, verse 3, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, he's using the relationship, not so much the Son, but the Father and Messiah. Jesus said, I have come to do my Father's will. And so he was submitted to the will of the Father, which was the plan of salvation to the beginning. And so Paul is going to build on that, and he's illustrating that through the relationships or the society realities of a man and a woman. Now, we have to realize that in all of these relationships, 
Both are equal in importance, just different in performance. We're all equally important before the Lord. A man is just as equal in the sight of God. In an unsafe state, they are both seen as being spiritually dead. In a safe state, they are both seen as being children of God. God does not love men more than He loves women or vice versa. Matter of fact, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, but we are all one in Christ. But again, there needs to be order in the relationship. You can't have everybody being a boss, but you can't have nobody, I shouldn't say boss, you can't have everybody being the leader, and you can't have nobody being the leader. And so Paul is saying here in this illustration, just as it would look strange and not natural for a man to wear his hair as a woman, or a woman to wear her hair as a man, it would be just as unnatural for a man or woman to assume each other's roles. And so, God has given the man his role, and he is to fulfill it. And he is to dissect it, and he is to digest it, and he is to do all that God has called him to do, and be all whom God has called him to be. And it's the same thing on the other side for the woman. And as the woman focuses upon what she's supposed to do, and the man focuses upon what he is supposed to do, and they do those things, then you've got a relationship that God is going to bless. But it starts to fall apart when you have a man who starts to exalt himself as being special over the woman. Or a woman who starts to tear down the man, or however else it may work, and you start to see the thing fall apart. And that disorder... God is not going to bless. So go ahead and turn over now to Numbers, Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 and 2, and we find once again the issue is going to be vows. Vows. But in, underneath vows, we see God's desire for order within the household. Chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel. So he's more than likely speaking to 12 men here, the head of every single tribe, and it is to bleed down through the leadership into the people of Israel. And so this is a society thing. And Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded. So again, I don't know why all of a sudden he's bringing this up here, but more than likely, it's because it was an issue in society at the time. Because again, we're about to get into Deuteronomy, and we're about to go into so many issues of society, but at this point, this just needed to be addressed. Verse 2, If a man makes a vow <clears throat> excuse me, to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. When the words vow and oath are paired together, usually the meanings are a little contrasting in that a vow would be a promise to do something. Lord, I make a vow to you that I am going to set aside some time to pray every single day. Lord, I make a vow to you that this is going to be the year that I read through your Bible, I'm going to get a one-year Bible, and I'm going to go through it faithfully. Lord, this is going to be the year that I go to the men's breakfast this Saturday here at 8 o'clock this morning. So the idea is a promise to the positive, something you're going to do. An oath would be the promise to a negative, something that I will no longer do. Lord, I promise to, well, not to cuss, spit, or chew, or date women who do. Whatever it might be, something maybe you're struggling with. Lord, I promise I'm, I'm never going to do that again. So what you have done by saying those things, you have gone on record before the Lord saying that you're not going to do these things. And so these two first verses, it's important to note that this was to a man. We'll see a little bit later that they will also apply to a widow or a divorced woman. But as a man would stand up and say these things before the Lord, well, he was now obligated to perform these things. See, a vow or oath is a promise, gift, or action with the intent of lending weight to prayer. It's coming before the Lord, and it's just having a heartfelt mind in your prayer to worship God, and when you just 
experience the goodness of God and you want to do more, it would be appropriate, an appropriate offering to make a biblically aligned vow to the Lord. Maybe a sacrifice just because God is good. Maybe it's a moral issue in your life because you want to honor Him. Maybe, you know, say along the lines of, again, praying more. I know I don't pray enough, Lord, and you've just been so good to me. You answered that prayer on the prayer list that Pastor Mike prayed for on Thursday night. And Lord, I just want to enter into that. And so you just make a vow before the Lord to increase your... You know, again, it's just to have that deeper relationship with the Lord. It's not going to make the Lord love you anymore. It's not going to get you into a higher heaven or anything like that. But it's just, again, something that's to solidify your relationship or maybe even strengthen your relationship with the Lord. Now again, I've mentioned this before as we've studied vows and we've done so a few times. Nowhere in the Bible are we directed or commanded to make a vow or to take an oath. This is something that is not commanded, but that which is voluntary. But once you have done it, it now changes from something to be voluntary to now become obligatory. Once you have made the vow or made the oath, then you are responsible before the Lord to follow through. And so what we see in that, what we can extrapolate from that, just as God is true to His Word, expects you to be true to His Word. So it doesn't matter if you signed the contract. If you agreed, you made a vow and, and you need to follow through. It doesn't matter if you made the promise in, well, if you, something else came up. No, you made the promise and you need to follow through. Our yes needs to be yes, and our no needs to be no. We live in a time when a man's word just doesn't mean a whole lot anymore. I'd like to think that that's just outside the church. I look at the contracts that the athletes, since they're so predominant in the news, does a contract that an athlete signed mean absolutely anything at all? Because, I mean, you're, you're seeing these athletes, they're, they're holding out. Well, the, and it always blows my mind, because the guy's got a contract. He, he gave, and it seems like from, from a moral perspective, he gave his word that you give me so much money and I'll play for the football team. But also, it seems like he's legally obligated as well. But again, that, that's just filtered down through so many different areas in our society that, well, it just doesn't seem like a person's word just means all that much anymore. It even goes one step further. What are we doing when placing our hands upon a Bible and making a vow to tell the whole, whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, so help us God? Again, understand that we are making a vow when we do that, and the whole legal system of witness and testimony is dependent upon the truthfulness of somebody's word. I remember when I sat on a jury, I was elected to stay in the jury box, and watch the whole thing transform. And one thing that I saw, they were real protective of the Word. I don't mean the Word, the Word of God, but the truthfulness of one's Word. Everybody that stood up there, they were giving the, the oath that they were to keep, the, the, the promises that they made to speak the truth and all. I was looking over at this man who, by the way, is guilty of sin. and thinking, why is he even going through this? But nonetheless... He deserved to have a free trial because that's what our, our Bill of Rights says that, that he had due coming to him if he so desired and he was found guilty. And so much were they wanting to keep the truthfulness of, of this whole thing that the jurist was not allowed to talk to anybody. And so I sat on this thing for a week. went through the, And it was a good thing. I enjoyed doing it. But last day, there was going to be one or two more people that were given testimony. And we were all sitting out in the hallway and I saw this man walk by, and he walked in. I thought, it kind of looks familiar, but didn't really think two things about it. He came back out, and I just didn't really pay much attention. And we go to walk in, and I was the first one up to the door. And so being the nice guy that I am, I held the door open for everybody. And then I go to step in, and somebody puts their hand on my shoulder. And he said, Mike, how are you doing? And I turned around, and I realized, now I knew this guy was one of the witnesses. And I, I just said, I can't talk to you. He goes, no, it's me, it's Joe. And I go, I can't talk to you. Well, both of the attorneys were facing me, and I walked over and I talked to the bailiff, and I said, I know that guy, and I, I talked to him. And they kicked me off the jury for that. It's because the testimony, and to keep that pure, and to keep the words that were spoken pure, that they would not have a jury. Now, I didn't do anything, and I really didn't do anything wrong. Really, it was his fault, but he didn't really recognize who I was. There was no evil intent in the whole thing, but the idea was to keep a pure testimony. And so... 
what about your testimony before God as you make a vow before the Lord? Now, what is that predicated upon? I have to realize that any vow or promise, if you will, that I make to God, it's predicated upon me being truthful in the words that I speak. But what's that predicated upon? That's predicated upon the truth that God speaks to me. And so based upon my necessity for God's word being truth, my word should be truth to Him as well. And so it's imperative for my salvation and for my daily life that God's word is true. How much more so, though, should my word, not more so, it can't be truer than God, obviously, but just as well my word be true also. Remember uh, what you spoke on the day that you were married? Vows. Made vows. You didn't make vows to one another on the day you were married. You didn't make vows to God. If you made them to one another, you made them to the wrong person. You made vows to God. You made vows to God that you would have and behold that person, that you would love that person for better, for worse, and, and, and the whole thing. And really what you were doing is you were making a vow to God to assume your God-given role. What God desired of a man, and what a man, uh, a God desired of a woman. And so that's why we have premarital, so that the woman understands her biblical role in marriage, and the man understands his biblical role in marriage. And the years to come after they're married, if there's a problem, if there's an issue, we can come back and revisit that again. But again, that we would assume God's desires for our role in marriage, or really it extends to every vow, every promise we make. Leviticus 19.12 says, And you shall not swear by my name falsely, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4-5, through 5, When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed, Better to not vow than to vow and not pay. And so you see the weight that God lends towards the giving of vows and the not keeping of vows. The worst example would be the day that you stood up and you made a vow before God that I will follow you for the rest of my life and not fulfill that. So, what I'm going to look at is the remaining of chapter 30 in a series of questions for the purpose of clarification. First one, as a man is responsible to keep his vows, how about if a young woman makes a vow? Verses 3 through 5. Or if a woman makes a vow to the Lord and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house, in her youth, and her father hears her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself, and her father holds his peace, then all of her vows shall stand, and every agreement with which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her father overrules her on the day that he hears, then none of her vows nor her agreements by which she has bound herself shall stand, and the Lord will release her because her father overruled her. Now again, her father, this is God's society, her father has been given stewardship over this family. Again, a steward is the one who is responsible for the riches of his master. And so this man is the spiritual leader of his house, and so to whom much is given, much is expected. This man is responsible. And so he is responsible for this young woman, this woman who is of marrying age, but is yet to be married. So if an unmarried woman makes a vow... It's up to the father to, to, to govern over what she has made, to make sure that she's not gone in a wrong direction. Why would this be necessary for the young woman and the, not the young man? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, it says, For of this sort, speaking of false teachers here, are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts. Now, all women aren't gullible. They're not all loaded down with sins and led away with various lusts. But the idea here is it was common for men to be educated and educated in the ways of the world. That's just the way that society worked, that a man would go out, he would more than likely become a, uh, 
become part of the trades, become an apprentice of some sort. He would start learning how to earn a living, how society works and all of those standards, where a woman would learn the ways of keeping a house. And so a woman would not be aware of the world and the things of the world. And because of a lack of the training that the men have, she could be more vulnerable than the man would. I remember my daughter, her husband is in, I don't remember where Andrew was at the time, either Afghanistan or in um, Iraq. But her van basically blew up. The motor in the van blew up. And the thing wasn't even that old. And so she called and they said, sorry, the warranty, it ended like maybe 100 miles ago. And I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> she's not taking advantage, this isn't right. And so I called them, and I, you know, argued with it, whatever, and he says, well, have her give me a call. And so she called, and I go, when you call, you know, make sure that you're, you know, you got your wits about you, you're serious, and, and you know, you handle this in a dignified way. And so she called and said, my husband's away, I called you up. And she just starts crying, and the guy just melted and gave her basically a new motor and put it in for no charge and gave her a warranty as well. But, you know, at first he thought he could take advantage of her because of who she was, and she was a woman who didn't have her God-ordained covering her husband, and my daughter's not real wise in the ways of the world. Hopefully she's not listening to this. And, 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 and so there was just that opportunity to take advantage of. And so again, this is God's means of protection. Not because the woman's not smart, not even because the woman's not able. You see that the woman can become able. But again, this would be somebody who is vulnerable. And this is the under, being underneath the shadow of God's wings, the leader that he has put over that particular young woman at the time. Now, a concept that we see in these verses is the importance and responsibility, though. When you look at the Father, see the importance of words. The importance of either speaking up, or remaining silent. There's really power in both. We all have the same responsibility when it comes to our response of the gospel. Are we going to speak up to the affirmative? Are we going to deny it? Or are we going to be quiet? Because to be quiet is just the same as if you denied it. There's power in the words. There's power in the silence. Both of them really speak volumes. 2 Corinthians 4.13 And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. And so when it comes to the gospel, there needs to be a response. When it comes to spiritual leadership of the home, there needs to be a response. And it's probably one of the most damaging things that I see as far as men, leaders in the house, kind of take a back seat. Maybe the wife doesn't so much assume the leadership in the house, but the man's not taking the mantle of leadership in the house. We need to be proactive on that because either speaking or silent, either way, you are going on record. And what record am I going on before the Lord? Second question, so what happens after this young woman does get married? Verses 6 and 8. If indeed she takes a husband while bound by her vows or by a rash utterance from her lips by which she bound herself, so this is a woman who made a vow, made an oath or whatever, father never said anything to negate it, and now she's getting married. It says, verse 7, And her husband hears it and makes no response to her on the day that he hears. Then her vow shall stand, and her agreement by which she, is bound, which she has bound herself shall stand. But if her husband overrules her on the day that he hears it, he shall make void her vow which she took and what she uttered with her lips by which she bound herself, and the Lord will release it. This is of God. And so you've got this young woman who made some sort of vow, Lord, I'm going to sacrifice a sheep every week to you. And so her husband says, well, that's not really practical, dear. You kind of got a little excited. You know, they get married. He hears about it maybe two months into the marriage. Lord, or I mean, dear, you can't really do that. You know, that's just, you just went off the deep end here. And so I'm going to avoid this. I'm going to avoid this vow. Well, she's released from it. The family's released from it. And so this was a means of which people would not become under unnecessary bondage through uh, foolishness of the heart. Now, the man we saw in verses 1 and 2, he's been trained in the ways of the world. And so he's responsible based upon the knowledge that he has received. This woman, in theory, hasn't received the same knowledge that he has, so she needs this leadership that has been placed over her to make these decisions. Now, these aren't really decisions that are made for her. What they need to be in a true relationship 
are, are, are decisions that are made together. The man is to take his wisdom and the woman, her desires, and they are to come together and come to that decision. If they can't come to a decision, then the man is to make the decision. So this husband's responsibility is the same as the father's of this young woman. It's all part of the to have and behold from this day forward. When my daughters got married, I performed the weddings on all of them. And I made it very clear to the young men that were taking their hands. I told them in the past, these girls needed protection. In the past, they needed security. And in the past, they wanted money. And I provided those things for them. And I told them of this miracle that was transpiring right before my eyes. I told them, when this ceremony is done, you will be the one that they run to when they need protection, not me. When they need security, you're going to be the one they run to. When they need money, <laughs> you're the one that they're going to go to because from this point on, you'll be the ones taking over the payments. And they've assumed their responsibility is very famous. I'm just passing that mantle of responsibility onto them because they are to be the leaders of their household. We've got an example of this in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. Hannah, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. Well, Hannah is the mother of the prophet Samuel. And apparently... Her husband, I'm sure, had heard about it because she ended up giving the child to the priest to raise, but she made this vow before the Lord. Notice it's in a spirit of prayer, lending weight to the prayer, and the husband did not void it, but approved of it, and it came to pass. Third question, what happens if this woman should become divorced or widowed? Verse 9, also, any vow of a widow or a divorced woman by which she has bound herself shall stand against her. Shall stand against her? The idea is she's going to be responsible herself. A woman in the Israeli society would be able to buy and sell property. They would be able to negotiate contracts, operate businesses, and be able to make vows and oaths. This woman has no patriarchal authority over her she would be responsible for the decisions that she made. And so, as she has been divorced, as she's been widowed during that time, she has a responsibility to step up and to become wise to the ways of the world, to understand the responsibilities that are placed upon a person and the decisions that a person makes. Now, what's kind of interesting here that it says, again, in any vow that a widow or divorced woman by which she has bound herself shall stand against her. They put the man who divorced his wife, now a woman for the most part couldn't divorce her husband, but a man who divorced his wife in the same place as they do a man who has died. And so you see the Lord's perspective on this and the responsibility once again as a man. Fourthly, how does this play out between a husband and wife daily? Verses 10 through 15. If she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an agreement with an oath, and her husband heard it and made no response to her and did not overrule her, then all of her vow shall stand, and every agreement by which she bound herself shall stand. But if her husband truly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatever proceeded from her lips concerning her vows or concerning the agreement binding her, it shall not stand. Her husband has made them void, and the Lord will release her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict her soul, her husband may confirm it or her husband may make it void. Now, if her husband makes no response, whatever to her from day to day, then he confirms all of her vows or all the agreements that bind her. He confirms them because he made no response to her on the day that he heard them. But if he does make them void after he has heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. So, Clarification. Verse 9, the widow and the uh, divorcee is kind of a parenthetical sandwich between the instruction for a woman who has become married and then the woman who has been married for a period of time. So her husband would, be ba would not be bound by a vow that she made before they were married, but once they were married, if she made a vow 
and he heard the vow and didn't say anything, same thing as the father, then it would have to be fulfilled. So he would be responsible. The family would be responsible. Again, verse 15, if he does not make them void after he has heard them, then he shall bear her guilt. It's going to be his responsibility. The bill collector, the Lord, whoever it is, however the void, or I'm sorry, the vow, uh, whoever the vow was made to, that person is going to look to him. He is the head of that family. That family is going to be bound by the vow that she made. So, either the vow would need to be fulfilled, or they could, if the vow was made to the Lord we saw in Leviticus chapter 27, you could make an offering in the place of the vow and be released from the vow, especially if the vow was to be unreasonable. Again, so what is Moses doing? He's given God-given instruction for how a society is to operate. When we veer from this, what happens? That society is just not going to be all that it can be. That society is not going to be blessed by God. Verse 16, These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between a father and his daughter in her youth, in her father's house. The illustration, illustration is Christ, the bridegroom, and the church, the bride. In that, well, he is our husband. He steps up for us and he makes intercession. How many times have we rashly spoke only to be delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ? Because of his grace and his mercy, which was lavished upon us from the cross. Look at the apostle Peter. Peter was a man who spoke rashly. He made quite a few vows. And I'll close with this in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, here's the vow, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. So just a couple of things in closing. Again, Peter just makes a rash vow that he cannot possibly fulfill. He cannot die for Christ, nor can he die with Christ. And Jesus understands the man. So before he even makes this vow, what did Jesus say? I've already interceded for you. I'm already praying for you. And he says, and when you return, that tells me two things. First, he's going to go away. He's going to stumble and fall, but he's going to come back. He's going to come back to where he needs to be. Why? Because his overseer, his protection, his umbrella is Christ. Is Jesus Christ. And how many times have we done some stupid thing, some, 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 said some silly thing, only to have it covered by the Lord Jesus Christ? God is so good. And it's a society that sees that, understands it, and operates in that, that has the blessing of the Lord. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. Again, Lord, it just goes so deep and it touches every area of our lives. And I just pray, Father, that we would be a people who are faithful to your word, that understand that we are blessed if we do these things, and yeah, a woman can come up with every, every reason why she should not submit to her husband. A husband can come up with every reason why he ought not to sacrificially love his wife. But the one that trumps it all is, Lord, this is what your word has said to do. And Father, we've seen this play out in our society as we've gotten away from your word. Our society, Lord, has become very godless. It's become very messy. And so, Father, I pray that we as the church, that we would cling to these things, Father, the areas that, that, that apply to our lives, apply to our homes, I pray, Father, we would grasp on to those and we would see, Father, the truthfulness of them play out through being faithful to them. So, Father, again, we just thank you for tonight. Just pray, Father, that you would bless us for being here. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.